Hi, welcome back. This is Brian Devine, the math guy at Hamilton Education. And today we're going over the mathematics section of the digital SAT coded 395. Now, this is a real College Board test. This is written by College Board writers, so expect it to be evil because College Board writers are hired because they are inherently evil. Um, but that being said, let's get right into it. All right, let's get into it. Question number one's coming. Module two, first section. Question one, on the first day of a semester, a film club has 90 members. Each day after the first day of the semester, 10 new members join the film club. If no members leave the film club, how many total members will the film club have after um, four days after the first day of the semester? Well, we could write it out. I mean, if you're going to have 90 on the first day and then you're going to end up with uh, 10 more each day. After the first day, then we're adding 40 onto 90. And so the answer should be B. Now, you could have also looked at, it, at this as an arithmetic sequence of values. What would the number be on the fourth day? Well, the nth term in an arithmetic sequence is going to be the first term plus the common difference times n minus 1. Well, here we have day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, rather than four days after. And so we'd have that on the fifth day. And that's going to be the first term plus the common difference, which is 10 times one less than the number of terms, which would be four. And you can see again, this would give us 130 people in this film club on that fifth day and b is still your answer question two the graph of a system of linear equations is shown so they show us the two lines they don't give us the algebra and the solution to the system as at the is at the point x y which we can see right there that's the point for one and they ask us to identify the x of x, y, which is 4. Question 3. We have two lines and a line that goes across the two lines. We're told that m and n are parallel, and k is then a transversal. Which of the following statements is true? Well, we do know something right away, that these two angles right here are vertical. They're formed by two lines crossing. And x plus this one, where I put the dot, would be 180. And 145 plus that one, where I put the dot, would be 180, 180 degrees if I added them together. And so these two must be equal, which means the value of x is equal to 145. So c is the correct answer. Question four, the equation x plus y equals 1440, 1440 represents the number of minutes of daylight between sunrise and sunset, x. And the number of minutes of non-daylight, y, is on a particular day in Oak Park, Illinois. If this day has 670 minutes of daylight, how many minutes of non-daylight would it have? Well, we've got X given is 670. And then I would have Y would be the non-daylight, and they must equal 1440. So Y must equal 1440 minus 670. Or better yet, Y would equal 770. So 
770, B is our answer. Number five, Scott selected 20 employees at random from all 400 employees at a company. He found that 16 of the employees in this sample are enrolled in exactly three professional development courses this year. Based on Scott's findings, which of the following is the best estimate of the number of employees at the company who are enrolled in exactly three professional development courses this year? Well, if I let X be that thing we got to find, that's going to be out of all 400. And we're assuming that he's relating this to the 16 out of 20 ratio, which is the same as four fifths. So I should have that 5x would equal 4 times 400. If I cross multiply these two guys, and so X must be four-fifths of 400, which is 320 B. Number six, if 4X minus 28 equals negative 24, what's the value of X minus seven? Well, I look at this thing and I see that everything in this equation as a factor of four in it. And so if I take one fourth of this equation, 4x minus 28 equals negative 24, I should get one fourth of x is x, one fourth of 28 is seven, and one fourth of negative 24 would be negative six. So x minus seven is negative six. C is your answer. Number seven. For a snowstorm in a certain town, which is much better than an uncertain town, I never trust the uncertain towns, they don't know what's going on, the minimum rate of snowfall recorded was 0.6 inches per hour. And the maximum rate of snowfall, snowfall pardon me, recorded was 1.8 inches per hour, which inequality of true or pardon me, is true for all values of S, where S represents a rate of snowfall in inches per hour recorded for this snowstorm. Well, I know I've got to be between 0.6 inches per hour. And I know I've got a, well, top end would be 1.8 inches per hour. And so I should be somewhere in between there. I should be somewhere in between there. And what I wrote happens to coincide exactly with D. So D is my answer. Question eight, I'm given a system of equations. Y equals 4X and uh, Y equals X squared minus 12. And I know that the solution for X is positive. It says it right there. What is the value of X? Well, they told us that, that X squared minus 12 has to equal 4X at that point where they cross. So X squared minus 4X minus 12 would have to equal zero. And I can factor that as x plus 2 times x minus 6 equals 0. So x could be negative 2 to make this true, but we want the positive one. x is equal to 6. So if x equals 6, this would be true. And we'd have the positive value that made that true. For question 9, in question nine, a store sells two different sizes of containers of blueberries. The store sales of these blueberries totaled a lot, $8.96.86 last month. The equation 451 times X plus 6.07 times Y equals 896.86 represents this situation where X is the number of smaller containers sold, Y is the number of larger containers sold. And according to this equation, what is the price in dollars of each 
of the smaller containers. Well, they just told it to us. They just said the price of the smallest container would be $4.51 because this is in money and X and Y are in number of containers, then the coefficients of X and Y respectively must be the price for small and large containers. So $4.51 for a small container. In question 10, a right circular cylinder with a base of 22 centimeters, base diameter, so we've got a, a can in effect, it's 22 centimeters wide, if we look at it from the side, it's six centimeters tall. So right away, we do know the radius of this thing is going to be 11 centimeters. Because that would be half of the diameter of this thing. And the volume is given in the reference that you can open up the PDF, um, hit the button reference up on the top, and it's there for you. But the volume would be pi r squared h, where r is the radius and h is the height. And now I've got both of those. So pi times 11 squared, which would be 121, times the height, which is 6, and 6 times 121 times pi, would be 726. So C is your answer. For question 11, we're given the graph of a rational function. And we're told that this is f of x. And this is only for x greater than or equal to 0. We can see the graph is just in the first quadrant. Which of the following is the graph of f of x plus 5? Well, by adding 5 outside of f of x, we're going to move this thing up 5. Or in effect, we're going to move the axis down 5, same thing. And so we want the graph where it shows that this has been moved up 5. We can see that there is a horizontal asymptote here at 0. So we should find the graph with a horizontal asymptote at 5. So let's go look. Um, is it A? Well, let me get my magic thing. No. Is it B? No. Is it C? No. But it is D because I can see that this looks exactly like the graph up above, and it has a horizontal asymptote at 5. So I'm picking D. And I'm right. And so would you be had you picked D. For number 12, at a particular track, which is better than an uncertain track and a non-particular track, I think I made that point earlier, the ratio of coaches to athletes is, let me start this one over. I don't need that comment in there. I'm going to start this one over, David. I know you're making comments about it right now. Reed don't care. He just wants to get this done. Anyway, here we go. Take two. Number 12, at a particular track meet, the ratio of coaches to athletes is 1 to 26. If there are X coaches at the track meet, which of the following expressions represents the number of athletes at the track meet? Well, they said coaches to athletes should be 1 to 26 or X to 26 x because we can multiply this thing by x and it'll give us the answer which is b for number 13 kailani used fabric measuring five yards in length to make each suit for a men's choir the relationship between the number of suits kailani made x and the total length of fabric that she purchased y in yards is represented by the equation y minus 5x equals 6. Well, if y was the total amount of fabric and x was the number of suits, that you would figure there's 5 yards per suit. And so if I take the total minus the stuff used in the suits, 6 should be the stuff left over. 
And so this should be the amount of fabric that's left over because everything was in terms of fabric. So she got six more yards of fabric than she needed. D. For number 14, what is the value of 92 pi over 3? Well, I do know that 90 pi over 3 plus 2 pi over 3 would be the same as 90 pi over 3. And I do know that this thing would be the same then as 30 pi, which is the same thing as 15 times 2 pi. So I went around a circle 15 times, then I ended up here. So the tangent of this radian measure should be equivalent to the tangent of this radian measure. And I know for a fact that that's going to be, um, well, sine of 2 pi over 3 over cosine of 2 pi over 3, which is going to be negative rad 3 over 2 over, or probably positive rad 3 over 2 over negative 1 half, which should equal negative rad 3. So A is your answer. Now, I could have just put that in a calculator um, and then figured out what that would have been as a, a decimal because I could have plugged in the answers and done it that way. But I, I, ideally, I should know that on a unit circle, 2 pi over 3 is like uh, 120 degrees. And if I looked at that reference triangle, I'd have negative 1 half rad 3 over 2 and opposite over adjacent. Um, you know that old chestnut toa from Sokotoa. Anyway, A is the answer. In number 15, number 15, I'm asked in this triangle to find the value of cosine over x. And I note that x is this angle that's indicated, and the side 11 is adjacent, and the side 28 is across from the, that's the hypotenuse, it's across from the right angle. And I know that cosine by Sokatoa would be adjacent, which is 11, over hypotenuse, which is 28. And I could write that as a decimal. It'd be like 0.393-ish. So any of those were good. For number 16, the function g is defined algebraically as a product of two lines. So g is a quadratic. T is some constant. And in the xy plane, the graph of y equals g of x passes through this point, 24, 0. What is the value of g of 0? Well, I do know that if they gave me this point and it's on this function, then I can plug in 0 for g of x and 24 for x. So 24 plus 14 and t minus 24, I'm trying to find t, and I'm going to get from this that, well, this is going to equal, t's got to be 24. Because this thing isn't zero, this thing would have to be zero. So t is 24. So now I know that g of x is going to equal x plus 14. And 24 minus x. So g of 0 should be 14 times 24, which is going to be 336. So 336 was your answer. For number 17, I'm given an equation for a circle. I can see where this is centered at negative 4, 19, because it is in the form x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals the radius squared. So the radius must be 11. 
the point AB lies on the circle. Which of the following is a possible value for A? Well, I do know for a fact that I'm at the center, negative 419. So I can kind of picture that. I always like to sketch these. So I'm going to say negative 419 is like right there. And I know the radius is 11. So I'm going to have a circle that goes around that, and it's got to go to the right or left, 11 this way, which would mean I'd be at 7, or 11 this way, which means I'd be at negative 15. And so I'm going to have a circle that goes around here, radius of 11, but the X, or better yet, A in this place, so A is going to be there or a is going to be there which me or, or pardon me that's the lowest a and highest a i could have so a is going to be somewhere between negative 15 and 7 because there's only so many a's that i can have the a's up on top here or the a's down on bottom there and they're between 7 and 15. So I want a number that's between, pardon me, negative 15, between negative 15 and 7 that could be on the circle. And in looking at some of these, well, I, I'd be able to stick it in there. I'd want to be able to stick it in so it worked. And the only one that would work would be B. A could be if I stuck in um, 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 negative 16 isn't in the interval, pardon me, 11 isn't in the interval, 19 isn't in the interval. The only one that's in here is negative 14. So A could be negative 14. Long-winded explanation. For number 18, a right rectangular prism would be a box. I'd have a box that had a, a length of X that had a width seven less than that. And a height of nine. Well, got crushed a little bit in transport, but we'd have something that would look like this. A box. Not the best box, but Amazon crushes my delivery sometimes. This is what the boxes sometimes look like. But I'm assuming that it started out exactly with nice, clean edges. Well, if I look at that, I'm going to have 9 times X times X minus 7 would be the volume of this box. So D gives me the volume of that box. Question 19. Which of the following functions has have a minimum at the value negative three? Well, I look at both of these and they're both exponential. And if I look at the first one, I see that, well, that is going to have a horizontal asymptote at negative three. In fact, it'll look something like this where here's negative three, and it's going to do something like that. The next one, well, that would be the same kind of thing, but it would just be moved up. And so neither of them would have a minimum value at negative three. I could grab both of those on Desmos and see that. So D would be the correct answer. For number 20, the result of increasing the quantity X by 400%. Well, that would be 100% that I already have for X plus an increase of 400%. Then that would be 500% of. And so... I took five times X to get 60 is what the 
sentence says, and the question says, what's X? Well, X would then be 60 divided by 5, which would be 12. And if I did add 400% of 12 to 12, I would get 60. 48 plus 12 is 60. So A is your best answer. 21. The function f is defined in standard form as a quadratic where a, b, and c are constant. And the graph of f in the xy plane passes through these two points. Note that those would represent zeros. And a is an integer greater than 1. So this thing opens up. Which of the following could be a plus b? Well, they just said this, that y is going to be a times x minus 7, x plus 3. Those Using those facts that these two would be x-intercepts or zeros. And so y is going to be a times x squared minus 4x minus 21. And I know for a fact that um, I could rewrite that as y equals ax squared minus 4ax minus 21. And so I see that this is a, and this right here is b. So a plus b would have to be um, a minus 4a, which equals negative 3a. And note, this means that a plus b has to be a multiple of 3, which means it cannot be c and it cannot be d. And we know that then that a has to be greater than 1. So a greater than 1 implies a is greater than or equal to 2 because a is an integer. And I know then that, um, well, negative 3 times 2 would equal negative 6. So if A was 1, well, then B would be the answer. But the only one that makes sense now is A, which is apropos because we're looking for A, kind of. And A is the answer. Forget about B. We don't like B. We put everything in terms of A. 22. In number 22, the function G is defined by G of X equals X times the quantity X minus 2 times the quantity X plus 6 squared. And the value of G of 7 minus W is 0, where W is some constant. What's the sum of all possible values of W? Well, they just told me that zero would be equal to, um, well, if I stuck this in for X, seven minus W, and if I stuck it in here, seven minus W minus two, and then I'd have seven minus W plus six squared. So that's going to be zero is equal to seven minus W times uh, five minus W times uh, 13 minus W squared. And so this would make it zero, seven. This would make it zero, five. And this would make it zero, 13. If W was any of those, then this thing equals zero. So 7 plus 5 plus 13 equals um, 25. There's your answer. section 2 on module 2. Question 1. Argon is placed inside a container with a constant volume. The graph shows the estimated pressure Y in pounds per square inch of argon when its temperature is X degrees Kelvin. 
what is the estimated pressure of the argon in PSI when the temperature is 600 degrees Kelvin? Well, let's go to 600. Let's go up until we hit the graph and then over until we get to a value. It should be 12 PSI. So B is the correct answer. Question two, if 6N equals 12, what is the value of N plus four? Well, if 6N equals 12, I can divide both sides by six to show that N's gotta be two. And I can add four to that because now I'd have two plus four. So the question was, what's two plus four? It's six. In question three, we're given D minus 30 times the quantity D plus 30 minus seven equals negative seven. So in effect, they said D minus 30 times D plus 30 would have to equal zero if we added seven to both sides. And so D could be positive 30, or D could be negative 30. Either of those were potential answers. So you could put that, or you could put that. Question four, a competitive diver dives from a platform into the water. The shape of the dive would look something like that over time. But the graph of the height from the water would look like that over time. The graph shown gives the height above the water y in meters of the diver x seconds after diving from the platform. What is the best interpretation of the x-intercept? Well, I would assume it's when the diver hits the water, and that's about 1.6 seconds, so the diver hits the water 1.6 seconds after they left the diving board. Question five, <laughs> the kinetic energy in joules of an object with mass nine kilograms traveling at a speed of V meters per second is given by the function K. So K of V is nine halves V squared. Kinetic energy is equal to one half mass times volume squared. Which of the following is the best interpretation of K of 34 in this context? Well, K is going to be energy in joules, and K of 34 then would be energy at a velocity of 34. So I want the one that says they're traveling at 34 meters per second and would have a K value or kinetic energy of 5,202. So A is my best bet, because that's what it says. So A would be the answer then. Question six, the scatter plot shows the relationship between two variables X and Y. A line of best fit for the data is also shown. For how many of the 10 data points is the actual Y value greater than the predicted y value on the line and so i want to count out the ones that are above the line four five six there's six of them c question seven at a movie theater there are a total of 350 customers each customer is located either in either theater A, theater B, or theater C. If one of these customers is selected at random, the probability of selecting a customer who's located in theater A, so A's probability is gonna be 0.48. And B's probability is gonna be 0.24. And C's probability well, they don't give us that, but there's only three theaters. And so what is 1.00 minus 0.48 plus 
Well, it's going to be 0.28. So C is 0.28 because these all have to add up to 1.00, all of the probabilities. Now, they said, hey, there's 350 customers. What's the probability that they're located in C? Well, there's a 28.28 chance or a 28% chance. So I'm going to take 0.28 times the total, and I get 98 people. So I'm going to say it could be 98, and it is. Oh, wait, <laughs> that should have been C. C, no, wait, <laughs> D, come on, Brian. Don't be like me. For question eight, what is the slope of the graph of this equation in the XY plane? I could stick it in Desmos right away and C and just count it out, or I could take this thing and clean it up. So I'm going to have y equals 29 thirds of x plus 10 thirds. And then and I would have, I'm going to change it to 15 thirds of x. 5x is now 15 thirds because now I can just add these two together and I'll have y equals 44 over 3 times x plus 10 over three, now I'm in M X plus B form, and I can identify the slope that the slope here would be 44 over three, or as a decimal, it's like 14.667666. Um, it's the devil's decimal um, after 14. For question nine, the length of each edge of a box is 29 inches. Well, if each edge of a box is 29, the same, it's a cube. And each side of the box is in the shape of a square. Well, it's a cube. The box does not have a lid. What is the exterior surface area? Well, it's an open box. That's 29 by 29 by 29. And the sides, although the picture doesn't give it justice, the sides and the uh, bottom would all be squares of 29 times 29, because this is 29 by 29 by 29. So I'd have one, two, three, four, and then the bottom, 5 times 29 squared would equal 4205. So 4,205 total square inches on the outside exterior surface area of the box. Question 10. We have five red mochiales, imbricot, turtles. We have five turtles, a type of sea turtle. Each have a nest. And the table shows an original data set of the number of eggs that each turtle laid in its nest. And a six nest, so we'll call it F, with 121 eggs was added to create a new data set. Which of the following correctly compares the means of the two data sets? If I look at the original one, so the mean of A through E, uh, I'm going to find that that equals 143.2. And then if I look at the mean of A through F, I can add them all up and I can divide by now 6 and I'll get 139.5. And so we have the mean of the original set is greater than the mean of the new set. So A would be our answer. But we can also look at it this way, is that the nest that I added was less than the other five. And so by adding that one in, I will actually drop the mean down a little bit because I added in a low-end outlier. It'll kind of push it towards the low end. So common sense, I could have answered A in a moment, but actually physically finding the means and seeing that the original one was greater 
verifies it, and thus A is the answer. For number 11, in triangle RST, the measure of angle R is 63 degrees. Which of the following could be the measure in degrees of angle S? Well, they did tell me this, that if I look at RST, that this is 63 degrees. And so I know that S plus T has to be greater than zero and less than 180 minus 63. Or clean that up a little bit. The sum of the other two angles has to be less than 117 which means that S would have to be less than 117, which means that S realistically could be 116. So A would be your answer. Number 12, which expression is equivalent to this? Well, I'm just going to clean it up. So I'd have 8X cubed minus X cubed, and then I'm going to add 8 plus 2. And so if I look at that, then I should have um, 7x cubed. And I should be adding to that 10. So I should have something like that. B. Number 13. If 4 times rad 2x, square root of 2x, is equal to 16, What's the value of 6x? Well, I can divide both sides by 4, so I'm going to have that rad or square root of 2x would be 4, which means that 2x could be 16, which means that 6x, 3 times that, could be 48. And 48 is one of the answers. So I'm going to glom onto that and get a point. Question 14. We're given an inequality that 2x minus y is greater than 883. Well, that's telling me that y has to be less than 2x minus 883. And that's something I can graph. That's something that I can definitely graph on Desmos. And if I look at the fact that, well, all these X's are 440, 441, 442, or something like that. In fact, all of them are, is that, well, if X was 440, then I would have Y has to be less than negative 3. And if X was 441, then I would have y is less than negative 1. And if x was 4, 4, 2, then I would have x is less than 1. And so the first one tells me that it's not going to be a, b, or c. The second one tells me it's definitely not a. The third one tells me it's not a, b, or c. Well, that kind of tells me what it is. It's got to be d because all of these are true. That's supposed to be a y down there. y is less than 1. But if x is 442, if x is 441, if x is 440, then d is the only one that is true. So d is your best friend. For number 15, in number 15, we have a system of linear equations. And I'm told that there is a solution, and I want to know what's 30 times the value of x. Well, I note that if I just add these two equations together, I get 0 equals 15x minus 10, which means that x must be 2 thirds. And 30 times 2 thirds is going to be 20. So 20 is my answer. 16. 
A rectangle is inscribed in a circle such that each vertex of the rectangle lies on the circumference of the circle. So we can we can draw that. I mean, if I have a circle and then I've got a rectangle such that it does something like this. Then my picture looks a little flat, but what we're pointing out is that the diagonal of the rectangle would have to be the diameter of the circle. And I'm going to use that. So the diagonal of the rectangle is twice the length of the shortest side. So if I call the shortest side x, then the diagonal is 2x. Well, they just described the 30, 60, 90 relationship. This has to be x root 3 down here. And so if they told me that the area of the rectangle was 1089 root 3, then I know that, well, x times x root 3 has to be 1089 rad 3, which means x squared is 1089, which means that x equals 33, because I got a calculator. And I wanted to find then the diameter of the circle. Well, that would be 2x. So 2x is 66. Number 17. We have two rectangles we're told about here. We've got some rectangle A, B, C, D, and we've got some similar rectangle E, F, G, H. Um, the length of each side of E, F, G, H is six times the that of A, B, C, D. So if I call this width and I call this length, then this has to be six times the width which makes this six times the length. Got to have that. So I know that the length and width here has to be 54. So the area of this, well, it should be um, 6W times 6L, which would equal 6 times L times W, which we saw in uh, rectangle A, B, C, D. I should have labeled those. And this is E, F, G, H. So I should have 6 squared, 36, times 54, which is 1944. So D is the correct answer. Number 18, which expression is equivalent to 42a over k plus 42a times k? Well, I need a common denominator here, which would be k. So 42a plus 42a k squared over k. Because I just multiplied this one by k over k to get that common denominator. Now, I can clean this up a little bit because each of the terms above is going to have 42a in it. I could write this as 42a times 1 plus k squared over k. And I see that that's one of the answers. So I jump on it and I grab a hold of it and I do not let it go. And I get a point. D is the answer. Number 19, which quadratic has no real solutions? So what they just said is that in the quadratic formula, b squared minus 4ac is negative. That would mean I'd have only complex, non-real, not real, no real solutions. So if I look at a, I see that um, b squared minus 4ac would be 14 squared plus 4 times 49, which is definitely positive. So it's not a. And if I look at b, 
I see negative 14 squared minus 4 times 49, and that equals zero. Well, that means I'll have one real solution, so it's not that one. If I look at C, I see I get negative 14 squared plus 4 times 5 times 49, which is definitely positive. So that one had two real roots because it was positive. This one had just one repeated real root because it equaled zero. This one, like A, had two real roots. Well, guess which one it is. If we look at D, I see that negative 14 squared minus 4 times 5 times 49 would definitely be negative. And so the only one that had two complex or non-real roots would be D. Now you could graph each one, and this would be the only one that does not cross the x-axis. It will be floating above the x-axis. It'll have a y-intercept of 49. The axis of symmetry is going to be over here on the right side of the y-axis, but it will not cross the y-axis. All the others will touch or cross. Number 20, we're given an exponential function. P of t is 260, our initial value, times 1.04. We're increasing by 4%, and we have this 6 over 4 times t as an exponent. And so the function models the population in thousands of a certain city according to the model. The population is predicted to increase by 4% every N months, where T is in years. Where T is in years. And so we know that it's going to go up by 4% for every one increase of that exponent, when that goes up by 1. And if I look at 6 fourths of T equal to 1, then t must be 2 thirds of a year. Must be 2 thirds. And so n then would be 2 thirds times 12, where there's 12 months in a year, which would be 8 months. In 8 months, that'll go up by 4%. And that's pretty evident because 6 fourths of 8 should provide that increase then of 12 months, which would be one year. And so A is your answer. Question 21. A circle in the xy plane has a center at negative 1, 1, and line T is tangent to this circle at this point. And so if I look for which of the following points also lies on line T? Well, I do know this, that the slope between, it's supposed to be between, uh, the center and the tangent point. Five, negative four. Well, that has to be negative four. Um, um, minus 1 over um, 5 minus negative 1, which would give me negative 5 over 6. So the line T has to have slope that's perpendicular, which means it's going to be 6 fifths. And it goes through this point. So I know that this line T has to be defined as y equals 6 fifths times x minus 5 minus 4. I just use the point slope form. Or better yet, y equals 6 fifths x minus 10. And if I start plugging points in, a doesn't work, b doesn't work, but c works. 
D doesn't work either. But C works. If I put in 10 for X, I get out 2 for Y. So C is my friend. So I had to find the line T by using the slope between the center and the point on the circle. Then I knew that T had to be perpendicular because that line that is tangent to the circle is perpendicular to that radius. And that allowed me to find the line and test the points. Last one. Number 22, big ugly word problem. Big ugly word problem. For electrical field, placing a flat surface perpendicular to it, flux, electric field, oh my God. Oh my God. I'm going to go to the question first. Um, which is, if the total electric flux of the electric field through the surface is 4,640 volts meters, what is the electric flux in voltmeters through the larger square? So I'm going to go at it this way. Let X be the area of the small. And let 9X then be the area of the large. Because they said that the side length of the larger square was three times the side length of the smaller square. Now, I do know that if we put it through the total, it's going to come out as um, 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 29 volts per meter. Uh, passing uniformly through the total would give me 4 to 640. So what they said was that, that 29 times 10x, remember x is in square units, so we're good here, is going to be equal to 4640. So if we were to look at that, then x has to be 4640 over 290 which is 16. And 9x would then be 144. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 144 times that 29, and that shows me that 4176 would have been the flux going through the larger square. And the rest of it would have been the flux going through the smaller square. So 4176 would be the answer here. All right, that should be it then for this particular one.